Good morning, everybody. Welcome uh, to our tri-state webinar here today. Uh, I'm Kathy Lancaster. I'm with the Library of Michigan. And my colleagues here, we have Beth Yates from Indiana State Library. I'm just going to give a little wave there. And uh, Janet Ingram Dr Dwyer from Ohio uh, is here with us today as well. And we're so excited to be able to offer this. If you um, would like in the chat to put your name, your library, and what state you are from, please do so, so that folks can kind of see uh, who all is here from across these three wonderful Midwest states. And uh, Janet's also going to pop uh, the links. I see she put them there to the slides for today as well as the survey at the end of this webinar, if you don't mind answering that. Um, and if you're in Indiana, there is a possibility for you to request CELEU certificate. So, um, oh, I'm seeing lots of folks here. Yay, Michigan. Uh, <laughs> we've got uh, Indiana, Ohio. Oh, I love it. All these great libraries coming in. So. Um, I'm going to hand it over to our colleague from the East Coast. Hi, Kim. Uh, this is Kim Powell, and she is uh, actually in my birth state of Connecticut. So we're so happy to have you here um, sharing with our states, Kim. And I'm going to let you take over. Yeah. Hello, everyone. My name is Kim Po. I am the children and young adult consultant with the Connecticut State Library, but I feel a little bit of Ohio in my heart because I got my master's from Kent State. So shout out to Ohio at the very least. <clears throat> I lived in, lived in Cleveland Heights for about a year. So um, I, I, do, I do feel the Midwest in my soul. Um, so I am actually just going to go ahead and get my screen share going. We are just going to get this whole kit and caboodle running. So um, uh, I've already said my name, but so this presentation is called um, From Diversity to Inclusion, How to Audit Your Collection and Why. We are going to spend quite a bit of time um, on the why. Um, we are also going to spend some time on the how. Um, but what I really hope people take out of this is the beginning of this title, From Diversity to Inclusion, because in my humble opinion, they are not the same. Um, and we want to make sure we have have a, a balance of both. There we go. Um, so like I said, we're just, we're gonna start the day. We're gonna talk about um, the definition of a diversity audit, why it's necessary to um, do an audit of our collection. We're going to hit on avoiding stereotypes and building collections that are diverse and inclusive because I think it's possible to be one, but not the other. We're gonna to touch on how to perform the diversity audit. And I know a lot of people struggle with where to find diverse literature. We're going to touch on that as well and a little bit on the context of the, the context of list making. I've got strong thoughts and feelings there also. So what is a diversity audit in sort of its strictest bare bones definition, a count of titles to help determine what percentage of your collection is made up of non-dominant voices. It's important to make sure that the materials reflect the diversity, not only in your community, but in your country, something that we really have to push against here in good old um, Connecticut. So why do we need to audit our collections, right? Like why is this something that we have to put our time into? And um, it's really because the industry isn't set up to do this for us. So I know that Janet shared some, um, some links in the chat, one of which is a link to these slides. You'll see um, sort of peppered throughout my slides, some of the titles of slides are blue hyperlinks and they'll take you to this information. So you'll be able to sort of dive into it later in your spare time. So the industry isn't set up to do this for us, which is why we have to put so much time and effort into it. This chart that you see here was compiled by Lee and Lowe in 2019. It's a breakdown of the publishing industry by race, gender, sexual orientation, and disability or able-bodiedness. So this chart was put together um, from 7,893 responses within the publishing industry. So this is not 
This is not, you know, a handful of people. Um, the results came from 153 companies um, that participated, and that includes all of the big five publishers. We know what they are. Eight review journals, 47 trade publishers, 35 university presses, and 63 literary agencies across North America. So they dove deep. And if you click on that hyperlink, you'll actually have access to seven other charts that look super similar to this one. Um, and those charts break down the same identifiers on the executive level, the editorial level, the sales level, the marketing and publicity level, the book reviewer level, the literary agent level, and the intern level. So you don't just get an industry overall view, they break it down to the nuts and bolts of the people who are making the decisions behind not only what books are published, how they are reviewed, and how they are advertised to us, and what we see the most of and what we see the least of. And plot twist, um, the only level that is less than 74% white is the intern level, which is pretty wild and also begs some questions of what's happening that folks who um, you know, are non-white that are interns, like they don't, they're not then peppered throughout the rest of, of these charts. Something's going on, don't know what it is, but it really begs some questions. So this infographic, many of you are probably familiar with, some of you probably even remember, the, I believe it was 2015 infographic. Um, and this, but for those who are not, um, this shows the um, percentage of diverse representation in children's book books in 2018. And I've sat through quite a few workshops where this image is used for one reason or another. Um, and again, if anyone hasn't seen this or really sat and stared deeply at it, it is absolutely worth sitting with for a while um, and really evaluating with, you know, all of your brain. But what shocks me is that a lot of people in presentations when talking about this will point out the mirrors and you know they'll say there's more books published by you know with animals and talking crayons and trucks um you know than with african or african-american asian pacific um islander or latinx or um you know indigenous american indians first nations but i a lot of people haven't don't really sort of call to the forefront of the room that there are more books published um, that have animals or crayons or trucks or whatever um, than all of the non-white white races combined. So it's not just that there's more books with Asians and crayons than you know books with indigenous characters. It's all of them. And that is super problematic. And I think when looking at this, um, the first sort of thought that can come to someone's mind is, well, you know, of course, you know, we've got, you know, Diary of a Worm and all the Karma Wilson bear sees shapes, color, bear sees all the things, you know, the, the crayons, like, well, of course, these books are for kids. But when there's more of those books, than every other non-white race combined, there is a problem there, regardless of whether that book is for a two-year-old, a five-year-old, or a 25-year-old. It's, it's suspect. So this is another infographic that maybe folks haven't seen. I don't even remember how I first saw this infographic, but it is compiled with information from the CCBC, the Cooperative Children's Book Center. Um, and this infographic was made by a small publishing company called Reflection Press in 2018. And there's actually more than one of these charts. There, there is so much information to kind of dive into here that we just do not have the time for. But one of the sort of what I would like to draw eyes to in this presentation is that the black rectangle there. So what this infographic is showing us is um, the, the percentage of books or the amount of books that would need to be published by, you know, different races sort of versus the population of that groups of people in America. So there's sort of like a percentage going on here. And 
what this infographic is showing us is that there would have needed to be 1,051 more books published in 2018 by indigenous and people of color authors in order for their ratios to be equal to that of white authors and white Americans. And I had someone look at this image once and say, well, at least that's not, like, at least it's not 10,000, right? Like, at least it's only 1,000. And we all know the sort of, like, James Pattersons of Youth Lit who are churning out a new book every six months. But on average, that's not the way it goes, right? So 1,000 plus books, one book might take someone three or four or five years to write. So this is not something that can be rectified in one or even two years because of the sort of amount of work that have to go into these works of literature that we love and that we share as readers and librarians. So again, the, this chart is hyperlinked. There are many more charts. There is so much to sort of stare at and pull from here. Um, but I just thought it was really important to kind of highlight this and also to you know bring to the forefront that what this um what this infographic is showing us is what how many more books would need to have been published for other for poc authors to be equal to write authors right and i think as a um community we have done a lot of talking about equity and equality and the difference between those so one more, I was really heavy with the infographics in the, in the beginning of putting this together. So one more just handy infographic that I think does a really, really good job of uh, providing visual representation for um, what it means within a community when systems are in, when systems perpetuate inequality when we sort of push for equality, where we have, you know, sort of this, the level ladders there, but the system itself is still broken. And then we go to equity where, you know, we raise one ladder, but the system is still broken, um, you know, to what hopefully one day in the utopian world of my dreams is we can actually reach for and strive and land on justice which is a fixed system so that everyone can have access to all of the things that they need. We'll see this, hopefully this presentation is just one, one little baby step to get us there. So what, right? So why, why did we go into all of this? And I went into all of this because the system is not currently set up for libraries to unconsciously curate inclusive collections. Right, it this the system is not built for this to happen on accident. If we actually want the inclusive collections that we talk about so often, we have to build them with intentionality. And more importantly, and what seems I think might be like sort of the hardest part of this is we have to actually take ownership of our collections. So, you know. I, I am not going to turn my nose up at the steps that are being taken to correct this inequity. The steps are big and visible with things like, you know, even though we're not using it anymore, own voices, disrupt text is fantastic, drag queen story hours, you know, super popular books like The Hate You Give and Dear Martin. I think it can really feel on the surface, like we can depend on publishing in the publishing industry and like book Twitter, um, you know, to help us curate these, you know, diverse collections, but it is actually more complicated than that because then, then we really have to dive into stereotypes and not even necessarily in the way you think. So think about your collections, right? Just like pull up a mental image of all the thousands of books. Are most of the books in your collection that feature indigenous people historical, right? Doesn't matter who wrote them, like just, just focus on that. Do most of the books in your collections about African-American or black characters take place in urban settings, right? Like you just will never see a brown face in rural anywhere, in suburban anywhere. Think about the books in your collection. When you think about the books in your collection that feature LGBT characters, is the premise of the book, these characters coming out, 
right, to their friends and family, as in the story of someone who is a member of the LGBTQIA community, this, their story stops once the world knows, right? And are most of the books in, you know, our collections that feature Latinx characters about immigrating to America, illegally coming to America, or being undocumented in America, as if there is no other space for these POC characters. So these are the types of things, right? I mean, there are the stereotype stereotypes that we will touch on, but these as well. Um, these are the kinds of things that can happen from blind list ordering. These are the kinds of things that can happen when you go and you oh, on Twitter, here's this diverse book list, here's this, dive, and you just sort of blindly order them. These are the kinds of things that can happen in your collection if you don't take ownership of it. You might look up and all but five, because maybe we can say, oh, but I have that one Marie Lou. I've got that one Marie Lou book, right? Where all but five of the books in your, in your collection about Latinx characters are about immigration, or all but five of the books in your collection with African-American protagonists take place in urban settings or feature some kind of gun violence, right? Like that is the, or, you know, I mean, I could just keep going. If we want to dedicate ourselves to the work of building inclusive collections, at some point, we have to steer our own ship and we have to begin to curate our collections using these other sources as secondary sources, but not primary. They cannot be our brains. We have to use the training that they made us, they made us get. Love Kent, but them student loans is very real. So when evaluating our collections, it's important that we make sure that the pieces of our collection about marginalized communities don't primarily tell a single story. So when we look at our collections, we have to look really closely at them. And that takes time. We'll touch base on time later. And I do just want to jump in and say that I really don't have enough like air in my body to emphasize how important it is that you know, if someone walks into your library and they are afraid about someone finding out their sexuality or they are still investigating it, or if someone walks in and they're afraid of someone finding out about their immigration status, or if someone is afraid to drive through certain neighborhoods, there is not enough air in the world to stress how important it is that those children and teens be able to walk into your library and pick up a book where they can find their story. There, that's, that's, there's not even a no but to that. That is just a necessity and it is magnanimous, especially now. So to yes and, so at the same time, it's not a one or another, this is a, a situation where two things can be true. At the same time, it's important to remember that there is more than one or three or five ways to be a member of the LGBT community for example, or to be an immigrant, for example, or to be Black or African American, for example. So we are going to play a little clip from my favorite TED Talk. I highly suggest everyone watch this entire TED Talk. Um, I'm pretty sure I have a link to it somewhere, um, like in these slides. Um, I always say her name wrong and I feel bad about it every time, but I do my best by saying Chimamanga Ngozi Adichie, that is the best I can do. Um, and in this TED talk, she breaks down her experience as an African immigrant in America, where people assume one thing about her because of her African heritage, right? So the danger of a single story. But what I really love about this particular clip is that you see that she in turn turns around and does the same thing when she is not constantly on her toes and on her game. So let's watch this. And Kathy, if you could give me a thumbs up if the sound is good, I'd appreciate that. My American roommate was shocked by me. She asked where I had learned to speak English so well and was confused when I said that Nigeria happened to have English as its official language. She asked if she could listen to what she called my tribal music, and was consequently very disappointed when I produced my tape of Mariah Carey. <laughs> she assumed that I did not know how to use a stove. What struck me was this. She had felt sorry for me even before she saw me. Her default position toward me as an African was a kind of patronizing, well-meaning pity. My roommate had a single story of Africa, 
a single story of catastrophe. In this single story, there was no possibility of Africans being similar to her in any way, no possibility of feelings more complex than pity, no possibility of a connection as human equals. I must say that before I went to the US, I didn't consciously identify as African. But in the US, whenever Africa came up, people turned to me, never mind that I knew nothing about places like Namibia. But I did come to embrace this new identity, and in many ways, I think of myself now as African, although I still get quite irritable when Africa is referred to as a country, the most recent example being my otherwise wonderful flight from Lagos two days ago, in which um, there was an announcement on the Virgin flight about their charity walk in India, Africa, and other countries. So after I had spent some years in the US as an African, I began to understand my roommate's response to me. If I had not grown up in Nigeria, and if all I knew about Africa were from popular images, I too would think that Africa was a place of beautiful landscapes, beautiful animals, and incomprehensible people fighting senseless wars, dying of poverty and AIDS, unable to speak for themselves, and waiting to be saved by a kind white foreigner. I would see Africans in the same way that I, as a child, had seen Fide's family. This single story of Africa ultimately comes, I think, from Western literature. Now, here's a quote from the writing of a London merchant called John Locke, who sailed to West Africa in 1561 and kept a fascinating account of his voyage. After referring to the black Africans as beasts who have no houses, he writes, they are also people without heads, having their mouths and eyes in their breasts. Now, I've laughed every time I've read this, and one must admire the imagination of John Locke. But what is important about his writing is that it represents the beginning of a tradition of telling African stories in the West, a tradition of sub-Saharan Africa as a place of negatives, of difference, of darkness, of people who, in the words of the wonderful poet, <coughs> Rudyard Kipling, a half devil, half child. And so I began to realize that my American roommate must have throughout her life seen and heard different versions of this single story. As had a professor who once told me that my novel was not authentically African. Now, I was quite willing to contend that there were a number of things wrong with the novel, that it had failed in a number of places, but I had not quite imagined that it had failed at achieving something called African authenticity. In fact, I did not know what African authenticity was. The professor told me that my characters were too much like him, an educated and middle-class man. My characters drove cars. They were not starving. Therefore, they were not authentically African. But I must quickly add that I, too, am just as guilty on the question of the single story. A few years ago, I visited Mexico from the US. The political climate in the US at the time was tense, and there were debates going on about immigration. And as often happens in America, immigration became synonymous with Mexicans. There were endless stories of Mexicans as people who were fleecing the healthcare system, sneaking across the border, being arrested at the border, that sort of thing. I remember walking around on my first day in Guadalajara, watching the people going to work, rolling up to tears in the marketplace, smoking, laughing. I remember first feeling slight surprise, and then I was overwhelmed with shame. I realized that I had been so immersed in the media coverage of Mexicans that they had become one thing in my mind, the abject immigrant. I had bought into the single story of Mexicans and I could not have been more ashamed of myself. So that is how to create a single story, show a people as one thing, as only one thing, over and over again, and that is what they become. So now my presentation, this whole diversity audit presentation could essentially just be that TED talk. Um, and again, I really suggest um, folks watch the whole thing. That is just one clip of it that I thought fit the best, um, you know, for this portion of the presentation, but it's a fantastic TED talk. So I also want to take a moment to read out loud some um, 
quotes that really stood out to me just sort of in my wanderings through the interweb um, from Nick Stone, if anyone does not know who she is. Nick Stone is a Black author who wrote Dear Martin, Odd One Out, Jackpot, Queen Getaway, probably more at this point. Um, and these statements that she has made on this slide and the next one are predominantly about, Af or entirely about African Americans. And my presentation definitely skews African American and Black for like super obvious reasons. That is the space in which I live. Um, and just sort of when I'm scouring the internet in my day-to-day -day life, that is that is where I, I, I sit and where I find a lot of things that I then add to my presentations. That being said, the principles for all marginalized groups are basically the same, right? The idea behind the words. Um, are the same. Um, Nick Stone in these quotes is just speaking from her experience as a Black female. So this quote is from an article she wrote, again, hyperlinked on this slide called Don't Just Read About Racism, Read Stories About Black People Living. And she said, Black lives didn't matter in books unless they were fighting their way out of abusive relationships or killing their children to keep them out of the bonds of slavery. Black people were sidekicks, lesson bearers, plot devices, plot devices to teach the white son and daughter of the failed white lawyer that racism is real. Addressing some of the very few black characters that she met in her high school reading criteria, some of which I think we can deduct from her quotes here. This other quote actually came from her Instagram. Like I really say that I find a lot of stuff just by scrolling through the internet. I'm not looking for it, it finds me. Um, so the hyperlink should take you to the exact post on her Instagram page if you have Instagram, I, if I did all of this right. Um, and she had a, a picture of sort of the spines of books stacked up and in her, her sort of long comment, she said, so while you're reading books about racism, because again, super important, also read books about explicitly black people, especially black kids, just being human, doing things humans are allowed to do in our imaginations, falling in love, dealing with illness, navigating time travel, questioning other as aspects of their identity, saving their country and fighting with their parents. It's, this whole thing is definitely a yes and situation. We need the realities of America because that's where we are is history of dealing with marginalized people. It absolutely needs to be prevalent on our shelves. If we're not careful though, and if that is predominantly or all of what we have, we will fall down and we will lead others down the same path of Chimamanga, I feel so bad every time I say it, I know it's wrong. Um, her TED talk of the, the danger and the power of perpetuating a single story and a single narrative. So basically our books need to be diverse in the sense that we have books on our shelves about characters from the non-dominant group. That is what I mean in this context when I am saying diversity. Our groups also need to tell the non-dominant story within that non-dominant group. And that is when I think we are striving for inclusivity. So as we're beginning to see more and more marginalized characters, um, those fighting to do this work, so you know everyone here and others who are fighting to do this work, um, can miss some common stereotypes that are more of a hindrance than a help for like the culture, right? Um, this is just a screenshot of some some I'm I'm sure we we have all heard sort of on our journey down this path. Um, but you know, for example, Asian American Pacific Islanders being depicted as the model minority or super smart at math or super smart smart at STEM or science, um, or you know, certain races of people being looked at as exotic or their food being exotic. I also like feel a really weird way about skin color being compared to like food. I don't know, like what, what skin color is a latte? I don't know, um, I just drink it. I don't actually look like lift up the lid to look at it. Or African-American men as gang members um, or, or oversexed or underemployed or African-American women, um, you know, the strong independent woman who don't need no man, right? Like we're allowed to cry. We're allowed to be emotional and just like be dramatic about whatever feels dramatic in the moment. So just, just a shot to get some of those 
um, for lack of a better term, more obvious, right, stereotypes out of the way, the ones that have dominated the narrative conversation, you know, as opposed to some of those more subtle differences. So in my humble opinion, these are some examples of books that deviate from the dominant narrative of their perspective identities. And we need just as many books like these in our collections, um, you know, as we do everything else. So in, in like this just like small squish of books, we see non-white characters recreated in Alice in Wonderland, saving the world, dancing ballet, defeating monsters, hunting for murderers, trying to save, lo save loved ones, seeing the future in really unfortunate and like strange ways, discovering magical worlds, entering cooking competitions, and falling in love with ghosts. Like poor cemetery boys, that struggle is real. We need just as much of this as we need the like the hate you gives of the world, right? It needs to be a balance. So now that we've got an idea of what our collection should look like, I told you I'd lean real hard into the why. What, what are sort of the logistics of auditing a collection? And the logistics of it, in my humble opinion, like the how is not necessarily the, the hard part, it is the time that it can take, which we'll touch a little bit on. So the process, right? Establish criteria. What are you auditing for? That is something that no one can tell you. You just have to decide. Are you going to audit, you know, the author? Do you want to make sure that the person who wrote the book is writing about a character that they, you know, of their lived experience? Do you want to audit for race, gender? You know, do you want to audit for body positivity, right? Some more nuanced things. That's something that you have to decide. Um, I highly suggest something like a shelf list. You need to know what you have in your collection in order to audit for it. Um, a shelf list is super helpful because sometimes things are checked out or missing or whatever. Um, and sometimes you can pull kind of like a double duty and do an, an audit and sort of like a shelf read at the same time. You then need to research each title for representation, and it's really at this point of the diversity audit process that I advocate for phoning a friend, for goodness sake. It is really this space at which you can utilize teen volunteers, right, at which you can utilize um, you know, other staff members, maybe folks who are part-time, who don't have as many like long and in-depth projects. This all, of course, is dependent upon your library, your library system. Speaking of library systems, are you a part of a system that works within the same general collection? Can you reach out to other librarians in the system to split up your collection for the representation for each title that matches the criteria that you establish in the first step? count everything up, do some fancy math, and then I say apply that data in meaningful ways. When I say apply that data in meaningful ways, there are libraries in Connecticut that I have helped through this process who have then put their information into fancy pie charts or bar graphs, did a write-up, and then presented that information to board members and directors when stating their case for maybe a slightly larger budget or to state their case for more PD time so that they can make sure that they're going out and learning everything that they need to learn in order to do this job properly. But also applying this data in a meaningful way as in learning your collection. Maybe you get all of this, you get the math, you get your percentages, your ratios, and you realize that I really need more books with indigenous representation. Good God, this is embarrassing, right? Like maybe that's what you get from your data. Dependent upon the criteria that you audited for, you may also receive an output that says, goodness gracious, we really need more books with um, indigenous representation that isn't historical, right? The end result, all culminates from your first step of the criteria that you that you establish. And again, it's, it's going to be different for everybody. I'm over here in Connecticut. We might be looking at things different than what folks are looking for in Ohio, right? It's just, you got to decide. 
So that's sort of the beginning. What you're going to need, like I said, shelf list, something that's super helpful, an audit form, be it paper or digital, where you keep track of all of this information. In the slides that you were given, the very last slide has my contact information and a link to an inclusive collections libguide page that I started making, I don't know, around March when Dr. Seuss fell apart, I think. And on that page is an actual audit form template. I made it for you. We'll see it later in the slides. I suggest a computer for keeping track of the information and the researching of that representation, data, national, state, and community data, and then an information presentation method. Like I said, maybe you wanna do pie charts, maybe you wanna write up a small white paper. But I'm gonna backtrack really quickly to data particularly being in Connecticut. I can, only, I can only speak for the states that I've lived in. Um, be really careful when leaning too deeply into that community or even state data. You might look that information up through Data Haven or Census, and you might find that your community is 90% white. And you might be like, oh, we're good, we're fine, right? Like our collection's 90% white, and so is our community. We did it, don't have to do any more work. It's not how it goes. Um, the communities that we have now may not be the communities that we have tomorrow. There is sort of this like undercurrent of talking in America, in this, this country where it's like one day the country is going to be, you know, is, is not going to be majority white. One day the country is going to be minority or majority black and brown, majority not white, right? We say that one day, one day, one day. But like the sort of plot twist of that conversation is it already happened. We blinked and we missed it, sort of. According to the Brookings Institute, as of 2018, less than half of the children under the age of 15 are white. So admittedly, it's 15 and under, but 15 and under will soon be 30 and under, 40 and under, 50 and under. It's not going to take long. We will live to see this happen. In, in my humble opinion, that someday happened in 2018 when we were able to pinpoint and target that this particular demographic of our country is already saying like, I'm not white, less than half of white. So what your community looks like today, it's not that it might not look that way tomorrow, it's that it probably won't, right? other things like redlining and stuff aside, whole separate presentation. Um, but I just, I just don't want people to get too locked into their community data or even their state data, because when we widen the lens a bit and look at the direction in which our country went, it's not even is going, it's they went there already, pretty soon all of this is going to change. And we might as well start working towards what our communities may look like now, instead of waiting for it to sort of show up at our door, like where are my books at, right? So here is a screenshot of that audit form template that exists that you all can go get right now. It's on the left side. It's like it says diversity audit template um, of that screen. This is it. Keep all of it, change it, do what you want, right? This is just a template that exists. I put this together for my own auditing purposes. All state libraries are different, but in Connecticut, we actually have like a whole very real circulating library. Um, it, we circulate to other libraries in the community, schools, public, academic, and not so much individuals. But that's a collection that I have to upkeep, maintain, purchase for, weed, and audit. Um, so that is where this came from. The uh, gray section is like title, author, call number. The green section is for auditing the author, right? If that is something that you choose to do, not always easy. For some of this stuff, you just might not find the information that you're looking for. And that's okay because authors don't have to tell you all their business. Um, so that's okay, but it's just there as a template in case folks are interested in looking at that. The blue section is for auditing the main characters, the protagonist, which is what, you know, sort of really matters and what we're looking for. And then I went ahead and threw, threw in the orange section, which is for genre, right? Like if you're going to get in there and if you're going to start doing this work, go big, right? If you have, why not, right? You're already sort of pulling all that information if that is something that matters to you. Again, just put it all together, 
it's all there. Folks can use it or not use it. Um, as we identified, people are going to audit for different things. Some people might want to audit for neurodisability or neurobility. Some people might want to audit for, you know, body neutrality. It's all up to you. And I do want to throw in the caveat in here. You'll see um, in the green there that there is still the hashtag own voices. I know, recognize, accept, and agree with we need diverse, we need diverse books decision to stop using the term own voices and instead identify authors and characters the way that the authors would like for them to be identified. Um, and yes, 100% agree. I made this form before all of that happened. What I can say is that for the purposes of like a bar graph, having a section for author own voices for auditing that might be helpful, right? When looking at just sort of the presentation method of this information, but again, completely up to you, but I did wanna speak to that. So this is a different, uh, I know it's really small. This is a different sort of form that was one of the inspirations for mine. And I just have that in there just to kind of point out that a book is gonna, may fall into multiple categories. So you can see here that there are titles that, you know, where they, where they check mark, you know, diverse author. I can't even really read these anymore because my screen is so tiny, but just, it's just sort of an image of what the auditing process may look like um, when you begin to get down in there and to do the work. So let's like really quickly run through what auditing a book might be like for verbally because this is the internet. So we're going to audit Cemetery Boys by um, Aiden Thomas because good God, I love that book. So um, we would start going, you know, across the, the sheet. I would check mark diverse author because I know that Aiden Thomas is a Latinx author. Again, I would check mark own voices because I think that could be very powerful when you are sort of turning this math into math. Um, I would then um, check mark NB trans, NB stands for non binary and trans. I know that about Aiden Thomas because of their. Twitter page. Twitter is really going to be helpful um, when looking into how authors identify because a lot of folks who feel comfortable are beginning to self-identify in their Twitter bios of all places. Um, so then moving into the blue section for our main character, I would check mark Latinx LGBTQIA because that is how the main character identifies. I would even check mark something that I put in there called own voice is joyful. I'm going to say because this is recorded, I do not know where I got that from. I don't feel like I created that. I don't feel like I did. I might have, but I don't think I did that. I think I saw it somewhere and I think it has just sort of followed me in my life. And when I say own voices, Joyful, I mean, so for example, this book is about a trans character. We all know the type of trauma um, that exists within the trans community without going into that and upsetting anybody. So by checkmarking own voices joyful, this book does not in the worst ways, right, that we all know exist, embody that trauma. That does not mean that this book is full of utopian perfectness. That does not mean that the main character in this book does not um, have issues with regards to their family accepting their trans identity. That's not what that means. But what it means is that some of the scariest stuff that is associated with various marginalized identities, you don't have to worry about that here. And then I would check mark contemporary fantasy and mystery thriller because that's how I view all of these. I I keep all of you in my minds and hearts who genreify books because I just couldn't do, I wouldn't know where to put this. Um, so that is just sort of a verbal walkthrough of how I would audit a book. And following sort of traditional, like deep, deep audit standards, that is what you would do for every single book in your collection. And it's probably stressing some of y'all out. Um, I can imagine right now there are people who are picturing the books in their collection and they're like, can't, can't, nope, nope, there's not enough days in the rest of my life to do this, right? Like I, I get it because like I said, I actually have, I wish I could, a very real, it looks like a library. People walk in there and think it's a public library, but it's not. 
But what I want to remind you of is that the inequities in our collection, collections took years to create. We cannot expect them to be undone in a week, month, or even a year. They may in fact take years to correct and that is okay. And if it helps ease the mind a bit, there are organizations out there that are working to help us with this and to streamline it. One of which I don't have a screenshot for it is Collection HQ. They do really cool things. You can generate really cool lists like dusty book lists. They, they tap into your collection and they can just, they can get all the data and generate all the lists. It's really fascinating. I've used it at one of my libraries before. They are working to build um, an, an audit feature into the structure of their system, right? It, it is a hard process because how do you, how do you audit for all of that, right? Like how does a computer go through and audit for things like own voices or own voices joyful? But folks are trying. There is also um, diverse book finders collection analysis tool. Um, this link, I believe, takes you to a video um, that sort of explains it, but in the LibGuides page that I've created, you can actually um, log into Web Junction and watch their little webinar on it, and um, it takes you through how to use it. It is a great tool. Again, just a tool, right? Like not something to lean on, just something to use, like a yes and situation. And it compares your collection to a collection that they have cultivated and cross references basically. And on their website, they do have their collection development policy to sort of explain, um, you know, what books they're bringing into their collection, but it does a cross reference. So in a sense, it can audit that portion of your collection in a millisecond. It's really great. It comes in really fast. What I do like about them is sort of similar to what we've been talking about is they audit not only the who, by multiracial, Asian Pacific Islander, indigenous, Latinx, not only the who, but the how. They have these categories, any child, beautiful child, biography, any child I think is really great. That means like this, based off the story, the race of the child doesn't really matter. Beautiful child focuses on identity and like the beautiful cultural and racial differences that exist um, within a person's identity. They will take a look at both of these at the same time with the titles that you upload to their connect collection analysis tool. And then this is an actual screenshot of the collection I told you that I have. It's not pretty, I'm ashamed, but I'm sharing this for the sake of the presentation. You get, again, bar graphs, charts. This is the kind of stuff that I think could, you can't deny it, especially if it's like color coded, when going to the powers that be within your institution. So it'll break down, you know, it has at the bottom, the, the how, the any child, beautiful child, and then it breaks down, um, you know, what percentage of your collection fits into those hows by race. The chart does the same thing, but the chart is actually clickable. So you can actually click on it and it'll take you to those titles that it put into that intersection of the who and the how. And it also gives you a little write-up. This is how many titles you uploaded. This is how many titles we evaluated. This is the percentage of your collection, um, you know, that, you know, has diverse representation based off of what we evaluated. Mine was 4%. It was really depressing. Again, this is just sort of an example of organizations working to streamline this to the best of their ability. Here's the thing, the collection or the um, diverse book finder collection analysis tool is only for picture books, right? Like at the moment, they're working to expand, but the amount of time that it will take us to audit their collection, our collections, it takes just as much time, if not more, to build these things. So they're coming, but computers might not be able to do this for us, which takes us back to steer your own ship, right? So where do we find these books? Quickly touching on them, utilize the places that already exist in your world. This is a screenshot from the back end of Baker and Taylor. I cannot guarantee that all of this stuff is perfect. I cannot guarantee that this doesn't fall into the trap of the danger of the single story. But what I do know is that it is a resource that already exists for those of us who use Baker and Taylor that we might not even realize is there. 
this is under their like current topics and trends. Particularly in the youth services world, I'm just gonna like click for a minute and let these pop up. And I could again have made my whole presentation just different, different ones of these. There are a host, a host of resources and all of these are hyperlinked. So you're, you can click on them and go to them. But so with that, I'm not gonna sit here, especially because I have to do it myself and pretend like this might not be a lot of work. But when I say a lot of work, I'm gonna put quotations around it because what I wonder is when people say something is a lot of work, particularly in this context, I wonder if what they are also saying, right? In addition to that, is that this is challenging, it is unfamiliar, it is daunting, and it is uncomfortable. And it can be, right? I know when I started as a librarian, however, ordering books and navigating Baker and Taylor and planning and running programs and story times with four-year-olds who seem to hate you that day and instigating community outreach efforts. All of that felt like a lot of work to me because it was unfamiliar and because I was new to librarianship. Just like when we had to stop using card catalogs when I was in middle school and use those ugly big Apple computers. That was hard. That was a struggle. I was upset about it. But I can't imagine going back to a card catalog to look for a title. The more you do something, the more routine it becomes, the easier it comes. I say this acknowledging that the transition itself is not necessarily easy, but we are we call ourselves and we know that we are community gatekeepers and the information that we keep within our collection matters. So I'm just gonna say, take your time, it's gonna be okay. I believe in you, we're gonna make it. And I have one last sort of practical suggestion, which is also gonna be the reason why if someone had planned to ask or has already asked if I'm gonna give a list of book titles, I'm not going to, and here's why. Um, and here's sort of my practical suggestion. Apart from traditional review journals, School Library Journal, Kirkus, Hornbook, apart from those, I would identify three to four alternate resources to check regularly. Maybe they can be from the list that is provided here in the slides. Identify three to four to check regularly in whatever way works for you. Now, for some people here, they might decide they want to keep an eye on We Need Diverse Books, Disrupt Text, and Lee and Low. Those might be the three that someone decides to keep an eye on. But a county over, a library realizes that their schools are having lots of really intense and good conversations around social justice topics. Teachers are phoning in requests, kids are coming in looking for books, parents are reading them as well. So someone, that person, a county over, they might not, um, they might decide that they don't necessarily need disrupt text, right? Because their school's already on it. They might wanna keep an eye on social justice books, right? But the, the county over there, they realize that they've got a really large immigrant population that's growing. They've got folks constantly asking for ESL classes. So they might decide that they need to keep an eye on I'm your neighbor or Latinx and kid lit. And then someone in the county south has a really fantastic relationship with the local LGBTQIA youth community. So they decide they need to pay attention to rainbow, the rainbow round table. So like, this is why I can't, I, I, I choose not to create a list and give it to people and be like, buy all of these because of those differences that might exist. And I'm not in your community, so I can't answer that for you. And again, I really want to empower people to take ownership of their collections. Do or do not, there is no try. By doing the work, you are doing the work. It is a never ending process. As long as books are being published, as long as we are buying books, we are going to be doing this. Do not feel like you are not doing enough if you are doing something. One step at a time, many bricks for a pyramid, yada, yada, all that. By doing the work, you are doing the work. Be nice to yourself, okay? It's my message from Connecticut. So break down your collection. Do not look at the whole thing and think I've got to audit 10,000 books for the love of God. Just look at like picture books with authors' last names A through C, right? Just start one, one piece at a time. Consider adding auditing to your schedule. Maybe you decide you, you can do it Tuesday mornings because nothing happens Tuesday mornings. Audit your carts. When you are buying a, when you are buying 30 books, 
for some reason, you chose those 30 books. I don't know why you chose them, but you chose those 30 books instead of 30 other books. Audit them right then in there. If you have a robust weeding schedule, which is my next thing, um, and, a, and you are constantly auditing your carts, your collection is going to audit itself. Again, it's gonna take a long time, but it took us a long time to get here. Read the books if you can. Read the books if you can. Phone that friend ask for help, and again, take ownership of your collection. The chat has 50 notifications. Goodness gracious, I don't know what any of them say. Are there any questions? I am also not in a hurry, so if this <laughs> lags a little bit, I'm not going anywhere. Kim, Thank you all. Kim, you're awesome. Thank you so much. This is Janet. I have been, um, Beth and Kathy and I have been collecting questions. There are some really thoughtful and awesome questions that have come up. We're going to try to work with Kim to address all of your questions in um, the time that you have, recognizing that Kim and I have all the time in the world, but some of you may have to be somewhere exactly at noon. So we'll, I'll stop talking, we'll do the best we can. Um, also, thank you for those of you who have been crowdsourcing answers to questions in the chat. We're gonna skip those questions and come back to them if we can, if a question has been addressed in some way or another. So I'm gonna start with something super easy. Megan asked a while ago, back um, Kim in the, how do we avoid stereotype slide? You mentioned several sources, including disrupt books. Are those also the sources that you shared in that second to, in the slide towards the end? Because she just wanted to repeat those sources. Yeah, yeah. So those and they're hyperlinks to everything. Um, Disrupt Text does some really good work with that. Social Justice Book Books does some really good work for that. The um, screenshot that I put in my slide, there's actually more. Like that was just box one. There are others. They are all linked in the slides and um, on the Inclusive Collections LibGuides page. Fabulous. Thank you, Kim. Um, Bree asked if there is any sort of open data sharing that you're aware of that's related to our, about diversity auditing. Um, she and there's a whenever you get to see the chat, she um, lists an example from her hometown at Elkhart um, Public Library. Um, so we I we gave that the good old college try here in Connecticut, and it didn't quite work. The problem that we ran into is that someone has to start the process. Like people have to be auditing and then sharing the information that they are auditing for in order for any type of crowdsourced thing to work. So in order for a crowdsourced initiative to work, the crowd has to be sourcing. But I think more people were waiting for the source than kind of being a position to add to it. So that's the problem that we ran into in Connecticut. I ironically, I still have all of that stuff. I don't know. I'll, I'll give it to you guys. Maybe, maybe you'll use it. But that's the problem that I ran into. That does not mean that every state or community will run into that problem. We made like a big Google form so that as people audited, they could actually just audit right in the form. And then it exported into a spreadsheet that was filterable which also could then help with like book talking. If someone said, I'm looking for books that meet this and this and this, in theory, you could have been able to use that form, use the filter and have a list of books there. Um, so that did not work for us in Connecticut, but the bones of what we tried do work. I'm happy to share that with Kathy, Beth and Janet to take a look at, and then maybe y'all can figure out something that'll work in your communities. Thank you so much, Kim. Um, Mer, I think you kind of addressed this in a little bit offhanded fashion when you talked about, um, you know, start with the picture books at the beginning of the alphabet. But Miranda asked, um, she says, ideally she'd handle every book in every collection, but do you have any suggestions for sampling the collection? My, my suggestion is kind of that that phone a friend. So, so there, there, there are folks who do audit collections and what they'll do is they'll pull like every eighth book, right? And then that way it's a bit more manageable. That's, that's something that can be done. My personal, this is just my personal philosophy is that if you've never done this work before, your results might be super, super skewed. That's the kind of thing I would suggest for maintenance. Once you've really given your collection the once over using kind of like a one in eight or one in five audit to sort of source your collection, um, that that's something that could help. But I mean, I would just kind of lean into 
other coworkers lean into summer volunteer needs or, or teen volunteers. And especially if you're auditing your, your youth collection, involve them. We have libraries here in Connecticut that have done that and had fantastic results of kids being like, nope, trash, nope, trash, this is great, keep it. And then it also gives them a little bit of ownership over the collection as well, which we all foster as folks who work with youth and teens in particular. And then just check up on their work, you know, then then go through and sort of look at some of the ways they audited books that you have read that you are familiar with to kind of make sure that folks are doing things the way that you want them to do. But some of this is subjective and you're not going to be able to find out all of the information. It just doesn't exist yet. And Thank yes, you. Would make a great teen intern project, Kathy. Thank you, Kim. Um, we had questions about own voices and about waiting, but I think that they were pretty much covered in the crowdsource and a little bit um, by you also. Those who ask those questions, if you want more information, please contact Kim. Um, there is a comment from Cindy Place at Bel Air Library who says um, that to start new books can have a subject heading that indicates the book has some of the diversity qualities we hope to include. So I wanted to share that. And then we have one more on um, one more new question. And uh, if you're able to stay on for a couple minutes, Beth has yeah. some, well, not you, Kim, of course you're oh. able to. <laughs> I'm sorry. That right. part, this that is my part house. was, oh. I know we just hang out here all day. I would love to, um, but for the, for the um, folks who are watching, if you can indulge us for just a couple more minutes, um, Beth has a couple of wrap up things, particularly for those of you from Indiana and Ohio and Michigan who might want a certificate. Um, although you already have the link to request the certificate, please do so no matter what state you're from, if you wish to have one, just in case we don't get to that. Um, anyway, Stacy asks, do you take into account how many copies of each title? Obviously, almost every system will have multiple copies of The Hate You Give because of popularity, but maybe only a couple copies of Cemetery Boys. Is it enough to just have the title available or what can we do to create awareness of lesser known diverse titles to be more fair? With regards to the audit process, I wouldn't add multiple titles because that's really going to skew the, the sort of data. What we're auditing is for like individual titles, like I wouldn't count all of the green eggs and hams or anything like that, or, or, or multiple copies of The Hate You Give or Dear Martin. I would just count the individual titles. But with regards to amplifying books, now I mean for those who can buy more than one copy of something, and, and deem those titles to be worth it by all means. But I think some of the strongest ways to draw attention to those titles is in reference interviews and in book talks. And when someone comes in and says, I'm, I'm in a romantic mood, I'm looking for books about love, don't default to you know the Sarah Dessens of the world. I think sometimes when we as librarians, when someone comes up and asks us for a book on mysteries, we default to like the James Patterson's. And it's not until someone comes in and says they're specifically looking for books that feature POC whatevers that then we dive into the POC's whatevers. I think if we are more intentional about focusing on what they're asking for and not like who they're asking for, right? right, with regards to race, I think that's going to do a lot of work for us. Um, so if someone comes in and they're like, I'm looking for books about ghosts, I, I'm feeling the ghosts, you can give them Holly Black and you can give them Cemetery Boys. And that's part of the reason why I say read the books. It's hard. Like I live in hoopla and audiobooks because otherwise like it's not going to happen. But also talk to, I talk, keep on to Twitter and like talk to the people in my orbit who are reading and try to remember those things. Um, thank you, Kathy. Yes, POC stands for person of color. Um, um, so that when people do come in and they are asking for a book about the first day of kindergarten, I can make sure that I give them books that feature a variety of races, but are addressing the need that they're coming in for, which is a book about kindergarten or mysteries or ghosts or romance or whatever. Thank you, Kim. There are a couple of questions that have come in that you, you can probably see now because you're not looking at your slides. Um, do you do you see Miranda's question about hard number goals? I, yeah, and someone else asked one about hard number goals and I don't have any. I don't, I'm gonna be very honest with you. Um, 
mostly we're kind of looking at the way the numbers are falling right now and aren't striving for like, once I've hit 10%, I'm good. Um, and that's sort of where the data can, can come in. That's sort of where, in theory, if you like Bridgeport, Connecticut, for example, or Hartford, Connecticut, are incredibly diverse communities, that's the community where you're going to see your Bloomfield, Connecticut, believe it or not, has more people of color than people who are white in that community. If your collection does not reflect that, you have some work to do. That might be a situation where in fiction in particular, nonfiction things get a little finicky, where if you know that your community is only 45% white, but your book collection is 95% white, you've got a problem and you need to fix it. I don't really have hard number specifics, because I think that may also vary community to community. Um, but if I if I ever settle on some numbers, I'll share them. But I, I, I get a I get a little concerned because I would I would hate for powers that be who are less supportive to use those hard numbers against you in your work, if that makes sense. Mm hmm. Thank you, Kim. Um, a question actually for Kathy. Will the chat also be available as well as the audio or the video recording? Sure, I can definitely make that a doc. I, I save it automatically. So we'll get that out. Awesome. Thanks very much. Um, if you don't mind, there's a there's another question in the chat from Bree that I think is absolutely fascinating and very, very timely. And I'd like us to sit with it for a minute. But for the sake of people who really need to move on to the next thing, Beth, do you want to um share i know that you did in the chat but do you have anything else that you need to say about certificate or anything like that oh sure i'll just verbalize it <laughs> i put it in the chat but um if you need an leu is what we call it in indiana or a uh, continuing education like credit certificate um, i've put the link in the chat i'll put it in there again in just a second and I just ask that you fill that out by Sunday night. I'm gonna send those out on Monday morning. And that's just for uh, people who are watching this live. If you're watching a recording, um, at least in Indiana, you'll need to have your uh, director or HR person create that certificate because they can verify that you watch the recording. That's all I have to say, except for thank you so much, Kim. Thank you all for coming. And I guess we're gonna stay on for a couple more minutes to keep answering questions. Yeah, sure. Thanks. I thank just wanna hear so here, Aaron S said something really awesome in the chat about visibility and all I just hear here. I just wanted to say that because I just read yes. it and I agree a hundred percent. Thank you, Aaron. Um, on the LEU thing, for people in Ohio who are working on recertification with Ohio Library Council for Library Staff or Public Librarian recertification, this does qualify for an hour of recertification credit either as a recording or as live. Um, if you're watching it as a recording, then contact me for the certificate because um, that's way past this at this point. But if you're here today and would like one for Ohio, um, you can do that. And uh, at this point, if anyone else has questions or comments, um, please continue to post them in the chat. And um, since we're kind of at that happy hour time, if it's possible, Kathy, I guess people can also unmute and just speak up. Um, but let me find my way back to this beautiful question of uh, beautiful and very like sad question from Bree. Um, our, our YA and children's collections have been recently watched by local groups targeting our collection for what they feel to be indoctrination. I hope people understand the spirit of what I mean when I say sad. We are all living under this, um, under this weight right now. How do we maintain allyship with kids uh, specifically and highlight these books while simultaneously keeping the, them safe? Have you found any particular ways to balance this that we're all experiencing? I, I wanna say we just, we in, I don't think it was just in Connecticut. I think it was offered widely from um, the Freedom to Read Foundation. They just did the most amazing workshop um, that was so enlightening and helpful with regards to advocating for yourself on, um, I'm trying to, I have had, I keep, I close my email for these presentations because the dings would drive me crazy. Um, but uh, from the Freedom to Read and they did a workshop on, um, on sort of, sort of the realities of when someone says that something is unconstitutional or this or that and, and why it has to be removed. I'm just trying to pull up the name of it. I'm, I'm 
bear with me. Um, managing and addressing book challenges in your community, law, policy, and advocacy. That was so incredibly helpful with regards to having a leg to stand on when having to fight for these titles in your collection. I have a recording in slides. I'm going to reach out and see if we're allowed to share those. I'm, I'm going to figure out what the logistics of that are. Um, but it the the inform like I mean they told you things like if you remove a book from the children's section and put it in the adult section because you're trying to find that weird Dr. Seuss balance that we were all dealing with, someone can actually come in and successfully sue your library for doing that. Um, that kind of information was so incredibly powerful with regards to having a leg to stand on when making our decisions. And one of the people speaking was speaking from the perspective of being like a practicing lawyer with regards to protecting our teens. I, I don't know if there is a right answer at the moment, especially because it's a battle we're still fighting, but my initiative is to, to the best of our abilities with regards to our mental health. Because I know I tapped out of Dr. Seuss. I was getting questions and emails and I tapped out and I asked some fantastic white allies to step up and do the work for me. Our intellectual freedom chair is Asian and she also tapped out and just didn't have the space for it. And we had some really fantastic white allies who ran on our behalf. But to the best of our mental ability, don't stop. Don't stop. I think there's also power in, I'm not even like a huge like data stan, but I think there is so much power in pulling together the data that we can, such as what they pulled together in Freedom to Read, where they were like, here is the actual law. Here are all of the words. Here's why you can't use its unconstitutional. Like, here's why that, that doesn't make any sense in this context. I think arming ourselves with the information that we know exists, the information that we are trained to retrieve um, is going to help us advocate for and help our teens. But again, I also wanna stress out that I know, especially for people of color out there, sometimes you just can't today. You just can't do it. And that's when I really like to ask and lean into white allies to help with some of that heavy lifting when you notice that your librarians of color are just mentally struggling because so many of these challenges are invalidating our existence as humans and to be seen and that is that can be so hurtful right but I know other times like I'm like I'll fight I'll fight well I'll have to fight in my personal email because I'm a government employee I we can have this conversation so that's kind of all I have at the moment, especially as this is all still unfolding. And if other people have thoughts, like, please say them. But yeah, I will immediately email the Freedom to Read people who shared this. I don't know if they're sharing it on their web. I don't know. I do know that um, our library association pays for any Connecticut Library Association member to also be a member of Freedom to Read, which is how I was able to access it. I think year long membership is only $25, right? If people have the ability, it might be worth looking into being a personal member to access all of this stuff. But that presentation was amazing and very helpful. I talk a lot, I'm really sorry. I feel very strongly about all, right. all of this. Oh, Thank 35. you, Kim. <laughs> I think I think I think we're up to date on questions. Um, but if we missed your question or comment, um, please go ahead and share. And I'll pass this back to Kathy to wrap up. Oh my gosh, this has been this has been a very powerful hour and thirteen minutes and counting. I could still stay on. <laughs> and and maybe we will. Um, I'm going to stop the recording now. But thank you, Kim, so much for your time and energy and. Um, all of this wonderful information. We've put a ton of links in the chat in addition to the slides. Um, and we're going to share all this out to the registrants for this. So we'll make sure it gets out there. Um, and I believe I saw a suggestion for an opt in email list. So we'll get that together um, between our three states here. Um, I think it's an important conversation to have and 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 super helpful to have folks to lean on as we as we go through this process. So thank you, Kim. Thank you for having me.
Maybe we need like a giant Slack channel or something. I don't know. 